Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Jeff Bazanz, and I'll be co-leading the service today with Audrey Brooks on behalf of the Social Justice Working Group and in place of our own Prime Minister, Brian, Brian Kiley. Uh, Brian and the Worship Committee have dedicated our, our services in January and February to understanding Indigenous spirituality. I'd especially like to welcome Cheryl Whiskey Jack, Executive Director of the uh, Bentero Traditional Healing Society. Cheryl is our guest this morning, and we'll hear from her later. The Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions from the world community. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here today. We gather this morning on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May recognizing our status as treaty people help us to be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to the land, and good ancestors to all our children. Now, if you haven't done so already, I invite you to silence your weapons of mass disruption now so as not to distract your neighbors during the service. Our topic today is resilience. A dictionary definition is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. People talk about resilience in all sorts of contexts, from mechanical engineering to communities. Resilience is a good thing in elastic bands. It's also a good thing in people, especially when they face adversity. We show resilience when we overcome challenges in our lives and we find and when we find alternative paths around barriers. We all have our own stories about resilience. The concept of resilience is really important in the study of child development. I was at a conference a few weeks ago and heard a Canadian psychologist, Michael Unger, talk about the nine things children need to be resilient. One through nine. They need structure in their life, some consistency, some consistency. They need to understand consequences of their actions. They need strong parent-child connections. They need lots and lots of strong social relationships. They need a powerful sense of identity, a strong sense of control, a sense of belonging, fair and just treatment, and physical and psychological safety. If you think back to the blanket exercise we held in this space a month ago, you'll recognize immediately that the treatment and experience of indigenous peoples over the past 300 years has not aligned with these principles. In fact, if you put the word not in front of each of those nine things, you pretty much have the curriculum framework for many residential schools. And yet many of our indigenous friends, neighbors, and communities are thriving, and indigenous culture and thinking seem to be having a growing influence in our city, our province, and our nation. Here we have a striking example of resilience that cannot be ignored. So our topic today is resilience of communities, of individuals, and of peoples. We'll start with some opening words from Audrey. The opening words are from Chief Dan George. O oh, great spirit, whose voice I hear in the winds, I come to you as one of your many children. I need your strength and your wisdom. Make me strong, not to be superior to my brothers and sisters, but to be able to fight my greatest enemy, myself. I'd like to invite Karen Huska to come forward and light our chalice. Let this light be a beacon to all who enter here. We are walking the same journey from life to death. How we walk our journey together gives meaning to the road we travel. If we walk peacefully, we will have peace together. If we walk practicing love, our journeys are blessed. A wise grandmother said, These are my people. I know this because when I look into their eyes, I see myself. We are all relatives. There, now that I've said this, now that I have said these words, we must make this world one world for all of us. This will be a good thing. 
I'm pleased to introduce our guest today, Cheryl Whiskeyjack. Cheryl is the executive director of the Bentero Traditional Healing Society. Bentero, created in 1994, has as its vision a world in which Aboriginal children, youth, and their families thrive. The mission, build on the strengths of Aboriginal children, youth, and their families to enable them to develop spiritually, emotionally, physically, and mentally so they can walk proudly in both the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities. With Cheryl's leadership and the dedicated work of staff and volunteers, Bantero provides an astounding variety of services and supports, from financial services to health to, to round dances. Cheryl also prov provides exceptional leadership at a variety of councils and tables across the city of Edmonton, including End Poverty Edmonton. So I look forward to hearing her insights and stories. Cheryl. I'm just starting my watch because I heard I have 15 minutes, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to stop. So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jeff and Audrey, for uh, welcoming me here this morning. I had a teacher and a mentor for many, many years at Bantero who taught me so much, who built on the things that I already had going for me. And her name was Shauna Seneca, and she was the founder of our organization. And one of the things she taught me very early on is not to prepare when you need to speak, to just speak from here. And she said, your heart doesn't know how to lie. And so the words that need to come out will come out. So I didn't prepare any notes. I do have one slide I want to look at while I'm up here at some point. Because I was asked to talk about resilience. And I was really quite enjoying when Jeff read the uh, mission statement of Bentero because I think the mission statement of Bentero is about resilience. And one of the reasons I have found such a home for myself there, I've been there since almost the beginning. It started in November of 1993, and I uh, came to them in uh, the spring of 1994. I found such a home for my heart there because the work that they do there is the way I live my life. So I'm just going to share a bit about myself with you all this morning and uh, hope that it ties into the story about resilience that I want to get across with you guys this morning. So my name is Cheryl Whiskey Jack. I used to be Cheryl Caboni, and uh, I come from an island in Ontario called Manitoulin Island. It's the largest freshwater island in the world, and it's in Lake Huron. So if you look at the three lakes on the weather map, uh, there's an island in one of them, and that's where I'm from. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Both sides of my family are from this island, from the same reserve. The reserve I'm from is called Wequemekong Unceded Indian Reserve. And I'm actually very blessed this morning to also share with you that my aunt, after hearing that I was going to be talking here this morning, offered to come and um, hear what I have to say and be of support. So it's really nice to see her out there smiling up at me. She is my mother's sister. And uh, in late 70s for me, I think early 80s for her, um, we made our way west. We made our way west because of the opportunities that were here in Alberta, and we have made it our home ever since. My mom came from a family of 12, six girls and six boys, and I know each and every one of them, and I know their kids, and I know their grandkids. So it's a very large family. On my dad's side, there was 14. There was 10 girls and four boys, and my mom and dad actually grew up very close together in the, in the same community on our reserve. So all my family is sort of from the same part of the, the island. And I go back there every summer. I grew up knowing all of these people, all my aunts, all my uncles, all my cousins, both sides of my grandparents. And I, I don't want to say I took it for granted. I just, I just knew that was my, my reality, that I had the, the love and support of all these people in my family. And um, it wasn't until I became an adult, I guess, that I started to appreciate what a gift I had in that. So we come out to Alberta. Initially, my dad's brother was the one who invited us to come out here because the streets were paved with gold. And there was a boom going on. My dad moved us all out here and found work very quickly, got us settled in very quickly. And not long after we came out here, the boom went bust. And everybody who came here from Ontario went back to Ontario, including my uncle. But my dad said, we're going to stay and we're going to make a life here. So we were here for a bit. 
kind of by ourselves. That's why I also think that the acknowledgement of the land that we're on and is, is an important acknowledgement to make because I am also a settler here from another place and I have benefited from the gifts that this land has, has to offer me. And one of those gifts was that Edmonton embraced our family when we moved here. Not long after we came, my aunt came. Um, she came out here to uh, nurse, and she nursed at the Royal Alec Hospital for 30 years, maybe. Long time. She just retired. And we thrived in our schools. We thrived in the church community that we grew up in. And not long after we came up here, my mom passed away. She was chronically ill when we came out here, and she passed away in 1983, so about four years after we came. So my dad became a single dad at an age where, well, I don't think you ever want to become a single dad, but you don't want to become a single dad of four girls who are the ages of 10 to 17 years of age. Like, the worst time to become a single dad. We were ragingly hormonal. Going through all these changes, he couldn't help us through. So one of the things he, he made sure was that we had women around us who could help us through those changes that we were going through, help us through the challenges that were coming ahead, and he made sure that we had really strong women around us. He also made sure we maintained our connection to where we were from. So we had opportunities always to go back home to Ontario and continue to develop those relationships with our family out there, know that the, the land that we came from was there, Um, that our ceremonies were there, that our roots were there, that all those things were there. Because having those roots gave us the ability to set up those roots when we were here. So we all grew up. um, We all finished high school. We started our post-secondary studies, all, all of us. And we found a way to make a life here. I found my husband here. My husband is Cree. I'm the only one of my four sisters that didn't have children, so I am that auntie. I am the rock star auntie in my family, and I have a special relationship with all of my sister's kids. And now I'm starting to have a relationship with my sister's grandkids. So in the room with us here today is my little niece, Infinity, and she's with the kids over there. And every weekend, and she's waving. (laughs) Every weekend, um, her or her sister comes and spends the weekend at, at my house with me and my husband. And I see it as my responsibility, just as it was my auntie's um, responsibility, to help my dad mother us. I see it as my responsibility to play a very important role in these little girls' lives. I have a responsibility to teach them who they are and where they come from. So ever since she came out of her mom, um, I have been bonded with her. I don't know. Her and I have something going on. I can take her anywhere. And so the first time she came home to Ontario with me, she was three years old. Just this little girl, three years old, usually kids are pretty attached to their parents still, right? Uh, They need them kind of close. They can be with you for a while, but they need to know that mom and dad are close. She was never like that because from the day she was born, she's had a place in my home, in my heart, and in every part of my life. And so when I talked to her parents about bringing her to Ontario, they're the ones who had all the anxiety. Infinity had none of that. So I took her home with me, and she knows all of us here. She knows all her aunties. She knows her uncles. She knows her cousins. She knows her everybody, her grandparents, and is very bonded to all of us in, in, in her own way. So I took her home to Ontario with me. She's three years old. And I watched this little explosion happen in her mind. Like, it was really real. When she realized that she was part of a much bigger network of people than she thought. Uh, If she thought 14 or 15 of us are a big family, here in Edmonton, she went home and found that she's part of a network of probably 500 people. You know, when you add our family up from both sides. These are her people. And this land that we were on when we were there is her land. That water over there was her water. That dirt under her feet was her dirt. And the grass in the fields was her grass. Everything about that place is hers. And I never have a problem bringing her home every year to be a part of where she comes from. We live out here. And so I want to her to take those gifts that I've, 
I've shared with her that knowledge that she's part of this really big community, this really big family, this really big nation, and I want her to carry those values here where she lives here in Alberta. I take her with me everywhere, so she's used to hearing me talk a lot. I feel those duties, the same kind of duties I feel here. This is where she was born, so she also has roots here in Alberta, and I want her to te- I want her to know about those roots she has here here in Alberta. So I make sure she's a part of ceremony. I make sure she's a part of uh, rites of passage here in Alberta. Uh, I take her with me every summer to pick medicines, so she understands that she has a connection to the land and a responsibility to the land. Last spring, I actually got her named, so she received her spirit name. Her and her sister both receive their spirit name. I do all these things because these are things that were shown to me as I was growing up. These were connections that were provided to me as I was growing up. And so I'm doing as I was taught. And I think that's what resilience is. Resilience is giving you all those tools, you know, that you carry around in here and in here that are going to help you through good times and through bad times. Last a couple of weeks ago, I was at a conference here in Edmonton, and I had the opportunity to listen to a Blackfoot MD, who is a family physician on the Siksika Reserve, and she was our keynote speaker one day. Her name is Dr. Lana Potts. She was sharing with us her story, and her story was about resilience, and she shared with us the reason that she was standing there that day. One of the most powerful parts of her presentation was she put up a slide behind her of her grade 6 class, and she's originally from the Picani Reserve. The slide behind her was her grade 6 class, and she shared with us that half the people in that class picture had passed away. They passed away from chronic illness. They passed away from addictions. Some of them passed away from suicide. And she shared with us that the reason she was standing before us that day as an MD was because she had all of these experiences in her life that grounded her all the way through. She was connected to her culture, and that really grounded her and gave her a sense of identity. She was really connected to her community and understood that she wasn't alone, even when she struggled, because she also struggled like many of her classmates, had a lot of the same similar social issues that they were experiencing, but she had a connection to her relatives and her community, and that's what helped her through those times. She got named at some point. She, in ceremony, she received her spirit name, and uh, that really grounded her also. Because when you get that name, you have a responsibility to uphold that name as well in all that you do in your life. And of course, she had spirituality. So her family, even when they struggled, they had ceremony to go back to. Um, and ceremony is really important. So as I was listening to her that day, I, I felt really kind of proud because uh, all the things that she was talking about that made her resilient were things that I'm doing and things that I've had done for me as I was growing up. My aunt is here today, I shared with you earlier, because last night I I was really wondering what I was going to talk about today because I kind of had a rough weekend. I had a rough weekend because a verdict came down, as many of you probably heard on the news on Friday, of a farmer in Saskatchewan who was acquitted of murder the impact that had on our community and lots of um, articles have been written about it lots of sharing has been done on social media about it and I had moments of great sadness over the weekend, I had moments of fear, but I also had moments of hope and I think those moments of hope are the the place that I want to ground myself in a lot of the comments that I saw on social media, I was sharing with Jeff this morning is that um, Canada is largely with our community in the sadness um, that they're feeling right now about the verdict that was handed down. And that was mostly the chatter that I saw on social media is that people are outraged, people are saddened, people feel generally bad about the verdict that was handed down. And that made me feel like we're not alone in this struggle that we're going through. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Bentero. Um, I didn't want to spend too much time talking about Bentero, but I did share at the beginning that I found a home there. Um, so I'm very connected to the people that I work with there. I'm very grounded in the work that we're there to do um, because the mission statement just resonates so much with me and how I live my life. 
we have a program over there called Working Warriors. And we did this program for a year for nothing, for free, because we were approached by our partners in the community. They're the um, Edmonton City Police. See, I'm going to finish my story because now my time is up. (laughs) So we're connected to the police, and they came to us and said, we're working with the top 50 young offenders here in Edmonton. And we're supposed to be, we have a special unit, and we're called the Y50. We're supposed to be doing something different with these kids, and I just don't feel like we're doing anything different. So these are kids that have pretty significant involvement with the justice system for some pretty serious crimes. They bounce in and out of institutions, EYOC and out into the community and back and forth. They wanted us to see what we could do with them. And so we started this program called Working Warriors, and what we're doing there is we're giving them an option that is a better option to make when they're not incarcerated, right? An option to make um, a living. So we're giving them training and skills so that they can go out there and find a job and sort of make a legitimate living. And these kids are, like, notorious. And when you see them in our halls, you would never think they're one of the top 50 young offenders here in Edmonton. You just wouldn't. I look at them, and I just see kids. They're kids. And they need all of those things that I was talking about earlier. And so at our organization, that's what we try really hard to provide for them. We provide them with opportunities to be in ceremony. We provide them a, a sense of grounding, connection to the land, connection to one another, and responsibility in that community that we have established there at Bentero, which is a smaller part of the community there here in Edmonton. One of the things we heard from our police is that they never make it off that list once they're on that list. Once you're on that list, you're on that list until you're an adult. And then typically you end up in the adult system. And we started this program, we're into our second year. Two kids from that list have been taken off that list and they've never seen that happen before. And it's because we treat them like they're kids, right? And we have a responsibility to teach them certain things and they're taking those teachings from us. So I know there's power in these things, and that's that's the story I wanted to share with you. There's story, there's uh, power in all of these things that I was sharing with you today. That are really simple, but they are very powerful and impactful. And I'm I'm a result of all of those very simple things. I'm hoping Infinity is going to be a result of those, and and the folks that we're serving at Bentero. That's our hope is that they are going to be a benefit from all of those as well. So thanks for having me here this morning. I'm going to stick around for a bit, actually, for the for the meal afterwards. So I'll be around if you want to chat. So thank you. Thank you, sure. Yeah. Do you want to do Q&A? Oh, sure. If there is, yeah. We have a few minutes. Now we have a microphone. Would anyone like to ask any questions of Cheryl now? We were all very hurt and disappointed and shocked by uh, the verdict in the Colton Bushy case. And I'd like to ask you, what can we do to make sure that the cause of reconciliation isn't set back a decade by that? I don't think there's any magic. I think um, the things that that the things that are happening right now need to continue to happen, and they need to. You need to insist, and I think demand from your leaders that those things continue to be of importance. I, I think it's a very scary time right now because there is potential, I think you're right, for this movement to take a few steps back. But I think we need to just stand the course. You know, as I reflected all weekend about what I think we could do going forward, what I can do, I need to keep doing what I'm doing, right? So I need to continue doing things like this. I'm doing a lot of things like this actually in the next couple of months. I'm speaking to a social work class in a couple of weeks. I'm going up to Fort McMurray a couple of weeks after that, and sharing the work that we're doing, sharing why it's so important, and encouraging people to also to continue doing what you're doing, having those conversations, participating in those activities, demanding more of your leaders, all of those things. And, that, and that's what we need to do. We need to keep... We didn't get here overnight, and we're not going to get out of here overnight. And I think part of some of these struggles that are happening right now are... That, that whip that you have when change is coming, you know, it's the resistance. And if you just keep applying that pressure, then, then the surge will, the surge will go forward. And that's what I believe will happen. So that's the way I'm, I'm choosing to go forward. One of the questions I want to ask is, how can we make sure that 
The Colton Bushi case, uh, that we don't have a resurgence of this again with another young person if this happens. But there was a, what the, the uncle said was an all-white jury. I don't like the term, but I know he was angry. But how can we make sure that there's some representation from the Indigenous on the juries if they have a yeah. case like this again in the future? I'm not sure. Jeff and I were actually talking about that this morning before the service, and there needs to be a change in, I guess, the laws of how juries get picked. Um, but I, I will say one of the things that that happens here in Edmonton that I think is kind of unique is that our community has a very close working relationship with the Edmonton City Police. So we're learning from each other and we're guiding each other. And when things happen, they call us and say, how can we approach this situation? And we advise them on how to do that. And that's something that I hadn't seen even 10 years ago. So the other thing I'll say about the reaction to the case is that the family around Colton Bushy has been really a leader in how we need to go forward. They've been very graceful, very graceful about n- not cowering from saying the words that need to be said, but they're not, in, they're not angry in a way that they're inciting violence or any repri- reprisals from that. And I, I think all of the communities that are uh, trying to support that family are taking their lead from that family. So that gives me hope. Nobody's like storming the Bastille, you know. They're, they're saying the words that need to be said, but they're leaving it at that. Thank you. One more question, Cheryl. Okay. Uh, Catherine. Uh, first of all, just thanks for coming to talk to us. And my question is, what can we like do as youth to help other youth that are in that kind of like situation? I think talk. You know, talk and spend time with one another is the is is the thing that's going to do it. I think one of the things that's been going on in our country for too long is we think we know where the others coming from and what they're thinking and how they're experiencing things and we we if we spend time together we find out our commonalities we find out ways we can support one another and i'm very excited about our young people today because i i believe they're the ones that are going to make the change happen they're growing up in a different world than i grew up in they're going to see the world in a different way than i've seen it so i'm very hopeful about our young people how connected you are and how willing you are to have conversations Mm-hmm. Thank you, Cheryl. And as Cheryl mentioned, she'll be around afterwards yes. for questions. I will be. I'll be around. So thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll begin our period of meditation. Um, earlier I listed nine things that children need to develop resilience, and you heard a lot of those things come out in Cheryl's description of her own life and what she's trying to provide for her niece. When I compare that list to the four directions of the medicine wheel, the spiritual, the emotional, the physical, and the mental, I noticed that the list of nine that I gave you that came out of research uh, fails to include the spiritual development direction. This omission seems obvious when you think about it. So as we meditate, we might want to think about the value of spiritual development in strengthening our own resilience and as individuals and as communities. I want to take a moment to thank Cheryl for coming. So thanks very much, Cheryl. It's wonderful. Thank you.